thank you for joining me for season three of Humanities Radio. I'm Janet Cunningham with the University of Utah College of Humanities, and today we're talking about conspiracy theories in our current climate of COVID-19. Each day, our news feeds are filled with information about COVID-19, and it's almost become sort of a game of separating fact from fiction. Jim Tabory, Associate Professor of Philosophy, is with me to talk more about these consp- conspiracy theories and why some people believe them. So this morning, I actually read an article saying that there were more than 2,000 conspiracy theories floating around about COVID-19. So why, why does COVID-19 seem to be a breeding ground for conspiracy theories? Great question. Yeah, I think at the heart of it, it's the fact that um, COVID-19 is an infectious disease. And the way to deal with an infectious disease effectively um, sort of welcomes uh, uh, or creates that breeding gra- ground for conspiracy theories that you've referenced. So let me unpack that, what I mean here. Um, you know, we've all, as we're living through this for the last six months, have experienced how the pandemic has just made very obvious how interconnected our lives are, right? So if we're thinking about you know, something you're doing one day, you know, having to sort of moderate whether or not you can go see a, an elderly grandparent the next day, or you're thinking about, um, you know, going back to school at the university and you've got a hybrid class and you need to, you know, wonder, uh, you know, which days am I going to be in the classroom and which days am I going to be watching online, right? Very, much of our lives now have pivoted to this world where we need to constantly think about other people and we need to constantly think about coordinating our own behavior with other people. Um, and then alongside that, right, we are forced to turn to expert on infectious diseases. Um, you know, and in many cases, right, th- these are people that I think probably your average uh, American had not heard of, um, you know, six months ago, or at least never imagined that, they're, that they would, these people would be making decisions that impacted them personally six months ago. Um, you know, epidemiologists, public health experts, the World Health Organization, right? All these experts in understanding, tracking, um, trying to control an infectious disease. Um, and so where the, the conspiracy theories then come in is, you know, lots of people uh, in the U.S. with particular political worldviews, um, are very uncomfortable with the idea that they need to, um, you know, sort of temper their own individual interests in order to align them with collaborative goals, um, or that they need to alter what they're doing and think about, you know, the greater good. Um, you know, there's a very strong kind of individual liberty, you know, I'll take care of myself, you take care of yourself in the United States and protect, you know, particularly in the mountain West, um, which just is not a sustainable strategy when you're dealing with an infectious disease pandemic. And, Alongside that, there's a lot of distrust out there of of experts, especially experts who say things that people don't want to hear, right? And so when we find ourselves in a situation where, you know, epidemiologists who we've never heard before or infectious disease doctors who who we've never heard before or World Health Organization, you know, that, that, that folks generally thought just sort of made decisions about, you know, other countries are now making decisions that have direct impact on, on our lives, um, that really sort of tees it up for, for people that are distrustful and uncomfortable with, um, you know, deprioritizing their own individual interests to find alternative explanations that would make this whole thing sort of uh, 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 at least intellectually go away and, t- and, and give them an alternative explanation that would suggest this is somehow being fabricated to, to take away their individual rights. Um, and then that's where you start to get the conspiracy theories. So what are some of these alternative explanations? I mean, I know we've seen a lot of them. I mean, most of us who read Twitter, read the news have seen most of them. Um, what are some of the theories or the alternative explanations about COVID-19 that have gained a lot of traction since this pandemic began? So remember, start with what was said in the previous question. Uh, much of this starts with distrust. So many of the conspiracy theories that are out there then put people who are distrusted at the center of them, people or institutions or organizations that are distrusted at the center of them. So, so what do I mean by that? 
And and also say there's an interesting way in which this sort of takes on different forms uh, in different parts of the world. Um, so in the United States, where there's a great deal of distrust um, of the government and of you know intellectuals and people deemed sort of elites. Um, uh, you know, you've got sort of the government is behind it versions of this. Um, you know, if people caught the pandemic video that was kind of circulating on 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 social media in April and then into May, you know, the, the idea here was that somehow this was a government, U.S. government plan designed to, you know, force American citizens to have to take a vaccine, um, you know, that would then, do, you know, do all sorts of different bad things. Um some of the major players, you know, that had already become uh, popular, you know, or, or well-known faces by that time, like Anthony Fauci, um, uh, were sort of taken to be at the center of this. So in, in the U.S., you've got a lot of uh, versions of like that, where it's, it's sort of the government is behind it. When you go to a different country um, like uh, England, or I would say Europe generally, but we can just talk about England for a moment. There's a little bit more trust of government, but greater distrust of um, private companies. And so, uh, you know, the, the 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 conspiracy theory that caught that you know most caught hold over there was that these 5G cell towers um, were actually sort of behind the the pandemic. That 5G cell towers that were going up, you know, were either sort of weakening people's immune system and, and, and letting, you know, and sort of making it easier for them to get sick or even somehow sort of like the radio waves were sending the virus around. I mean, they get all sorts of crazy. Um, but I mean, what's interesting there is right now when you move to a different country where the distrust shifts from government to private industry, now you've got, you know, the sort of private 5G companies that are actually behind it. Um, and then I would say, you know, the other thing that you almost always see, you know, regarding conspiracy theories, and this goes back centuries, um, is a distrust for certain racial and ethnic groups, and in particular, um, uh, Jewish people. And so it was, you know, you, you don't have to look far to find that um, someone like George Soros is somehow manufacturing this whole thing. Um, and that just aligns with longstanding efforts to um, uh, blame, uh, blame Jews for the problems of the world. So I want to know who is starting these theories. Is it, you know, some random person in his basement posting on Reddit and it just somehow catches on? Or are there actually legitimate organizations kind of adding flame to the fire or actually just all out starting these theories? Yeah, I don't think there's probably one single explanation for that. You know, there's there are certainly... Um, there are big names in like the conspiracy theory world, right? So like, you know, if you're the kind of person that really gravitates to these kind of things, there are podcasts you listen to. There are, um, you know, uh, internet sites that you go to. Um, uh, and, and, and those certainly do have a big influence, right? So like, again, if we sort of go over to the, um, on the 5G side in, um, in Britain, there's a very uh, well-known person over there named David Ick, um, and he was really promoting that 5G thing. And, and, and so it didn't just start with him, but he was a kind of, he was a, a, a fairly well-known figurehead who then gave voice to it and then other people picked it up. Um, you know, in the United States, we have things like Infowars, which, um, you know, traffics in this stuff all the time. Um, and as you know, over the last five or so years, um, you know, uh, uh, the administration of the United States, the White House administration, you know, um, amplifies this stuff as well. And so, you know, concepts like the deep state, which you sort of only would have heard on Infowars, um, you know, seven or eight years ago, now is just routinely used, you know, uh, on Fox News and routinely used by members of the White House administration. And that shows you how um, these concepts that were, you know, sort of confined to the space of what you might think of as like the conspiracy theory community have been used for political purposes more generally. Um, you know, but then you, you move on to something like the QAnon uh, conspiracy theories, you know, that started in, you know, 4chan uh, uh, websites devoted to conspiracy theories. It looked like, it, you know, in hindsight, it was one or several people that sort of tried to get this going by making it look like they were, you know, sort of providing clues that these people could suss out and then learn about, you know, how uh, Donald Trump was, you know, sort of actively using the the powers of government to take down a 
deep state cabal of satanic pedophiles. Um, you know, and, and that's wasn't picked up by obviously by any single person. And to this day, QAnon is a very, very amorphous thing. And, and, and very, you know, different people that sort of show sympathies to QAnon will tell you different theories about, you know, what is sort of at the heart of QAnon. So, you know, I think because because at the heart of these conspiracy theories is distrust, right? We all, all of us as humans sort of have elements of distrust in us, you know, and, and, and a bit of that is healthy. Um, but what you get with conspiracy theory and conspiracy theory communities is sort of distrust, just like sort of ramped up to unhealthy um, uh, levels. And, and that can just sort of allow conspiracy theories to thrive no matter how they come about, whether it's, you know, an, again, an obscure kind of post on 4chan or something that somebody says on Infowars or, um, uh, uh, you know, somebody dissatisfied with, you know, the official explanation of what happened on 9-11 and then goes about trying to, you know, cook up a different uh, explanation of it. So the... The people who are following these conspiracy theories, you know, websites and people and organizations, are they more likely to believe any conspiracy theory? Like if they believe one conspiracy about, you know, 5G, are they going to be more likely to cons- to believe a different conspiracy theory, the same, you know, the same thing about, you know, co- where COVID comes from? Yes, that's a great question. And, and it's and it's a definite yes. Um you know, um, there was a study that came out um, that looked at, and I, I guess what I would preface this by saying is, it's not just that they're more like that they're likely to buy into other conspiracy theories, but they're also uh, more likely to buy into competing conspiracy theories that can't sort of both be true. Um, so there was a study that came out that asked people kind of what happened to Osama bin Laden in, in Pakistan, um, you know, regarding the assassination of Osama bin Laden. And they gave the, the, particip- the research participants different possible explanations and asked them to rank them in terms of sort of how believable they are. And, you know, the, the, the explanations that they had to consider were everything from, you know, SEAL Team 6 went into Abbottabad and, and killed him. Um, uh, uh, SEAL Team 6 went into to Abbottabad, but when they got there, he was already dead, and so they didn't have to kill them. Or um, uh, SEAL Team 6 never killed uh, Osama bin Laden. In fact, he's still alive out there. A- and what the researchers found was um, if th- the more likely it was that people thought that uh, Osama bin Laden was still alive, the more likely they were to think that Osama bin Laden was already dead when SEAL Team 6 got there. And and the sort of independent variable that predicted that was distrust of official government explanations. And so what you've got here is this phenomenon where, you know, if, if people are inclined to distrust official explanations or distrust experts or distrust scientists, anything that smacks of providing an alternative narrative um, is going to be attractive, right? And so, you know, if, if when we move to something like the COVID, you know, domain, right? Um, uh, George Soros is, Soros is behind it. That's great. You know, it's believable for them. Uh, it's 5G cell towers. Sure, completely viable. Uh, it's Anthony Fauci in the U.S. government. Sure, you know, as long as as long as it's not the official version, which is, you know, this is an influenza pandemic. Wearing a mask is a good idea. We should be social distancing. You need to collaborate and coordinate with other people, right? Anything other than that is more believable. And so the sort of selectivity beyond, um, uh, you know, it's not the official version uh, goes down pretty quickly. So as a news consumer, just a general news consumer who maybe um, isn't maybe as educated on conspiracy theories, and they see these on Twitter or on Facebook or, you know, my uncle is posting something on Facebook. How do you weed out these conspiracy theories and how do you make sure you're getting accurate information? Yeah. You know, I would just use, you know, tried and true, um, you know, uh, uh, guidance on, on, on getting your information source. You know, I mean, a couple of ways to think about this, right? Um, you know, if your car breaks down, you go to a mechanic, right? You, you sort of trust the mechanic to say, okay, you know, this is the expert on how cars work. And so if something's wrong there, you know, she or he is the best person to figure it out. Um, 
if your cat gets cancer, you go to a vet, right? And you're going to sort of put your trust in them to sort it out because you don't know how feline oncology works, right? Um, the similar thing goes here. I mean, you know, in, 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 the infectious disease is not all that different in that sense from, you know, a car breaking down or, or your cat getting cancer. You know, there, there are experts who have devoted their lives and are most familiar with the information that's out there on this. Um, they're familiar with past examples of it. They know how to process the data. They know what the best data sources are. And so, you know, in part, you just want to kind of look to the experts, um, even if they're saying things that you might not necessarily, uh, you know, want to hear, um, you know, but also be comfortable with the fact that um, the information is going to change, right? Part of part of this whole experience is we're in, you know, we're experiencing something that, um, elements of it we haven't seen before. And so you have to sort of be responsive to the fact that the data is going to change and our behaviors and our coordinated efforts need to change as well. You know, so you want to look to sources that provide information about, you know, interactions with and reports from the experts, right? Um, uh, Twitter feeds, right? YouTube videos with, you know, creepy voices talking about, um, uh, you know, the end of the world, uh, that was not peer reviewed. The, you know, the, they don't issue or attraction statements when they get it wrong. They didn't interview anybody who actually knew what they were talking about, right? You want to go to reliable sources, investigative journalists, um, you know, that are trained to ask tough questions and track down answers and interact with people that know what's going on. You know, so I would, you know, you stick to places like um, the BBC, NPR, Washington Post, um, uh, these are tried and true places, and 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 you know they're going to be as good as we can get at figuring out what's going on right now. Um, and if they get it wrong, they'll tell you. That's perfect advice. So before we wrap up, wrap up, I would just like to get your thoughts on what are some or one just major conspiracy throughout history that gained a lot of check traction, specifically without social media. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's a much of the 9-11 truthers played out in a pre-social media world. Um, uh, and I think that's, you know, to the I, I often gravitate towards the 9-11 truthers, just so people are, these are people that um, do not think that, um, you know, what happened on 9-11 in the United States was the product of, you know, a handful of people um, uh, associated with Al-Qaeda hijacking planes and you know, then flying them into the World Trade Towers and the Pentagon and trying to get to the um, uh, Capitol, but going down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, they think, you know, well, the different versions think different things, but they think something else actually happened there and it was a government inside job. Um, you know, that some of that played out in the very kind of early moments of social media, but a lot of it was also, um, you know, shared with, you know, sort of mailed newsletters and people that put together videos and circulated videos. Um, uh, uh, you know, I think in part because I think 9-11 was kind of like, it, it remains the big, you know, sort of momentous event in American um, society of, of my generation. Um, seeing all the just kind of bizarre ways in which people um, gravitated towards different explanations. And, you know, it, while social media wasn't huge, there was, um, you know, internet. And so people could sort of, you know, track down all these, you know, the, the internet explanations of things and, you know, find these little niches where they could find communities that helped them, you know, sort of share, oh, you know, no, actually it was a controlled demolition. So that means we need to sort of talk to somebody who, you know, is in the sort of engineering world and help us figure out, you know, what, how, you know, the the Twin Towers came down from a controlled definition or demolition. And so that, that did happen. Um, but it did, you know, it happened in a, in a different way than we see things like QAnon or um, uh, 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 the COVID conspiracies playing out. That was Jim Tabory, Associate Professor of Philosophy. For more information about the College of Humanities, please visit humanities.utah.edu.